Hello everybody. Welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Hope you had a good uh, midterm break. Um, I just got back from vacation, so I had a bunch of vacations canceled by COVID, so it was nice to get away for a little while, but I'm glad to be back um, continuing on with the course. So I've changed up the, the order of the lectures a little bit. I was originally going to do the C++ code profiling and debugging lecture today, but what I'm going to do now is actually the uh, introduction to procedural content generation, because that's a bit more fun and it's needed for assignment three. So we'll get that out of the way first. So just let me know if you can hear me okay uh, in the chat and then I'll get going. Should be all fine. Apologies if I'm coughing a little bit today. I don't know, I uh, got a bit of a sniffle last night, so ho hopefully it's nothing serious. All right, so let's uh, let's get on with the lecture, and you can hear me. That's great. Perfect. So today, um, oops, this is supposed to be lecture number nine. Let me change that. There we go. So lecture number nine is about uh, procedural content generation, and we'll talk about what that is and what it means. And uh, we'll see that in order to do procedural content generation, usually we will need to be able to generate some random numbers for some definition of what random is. Um, so we'll talk about random number generation as well toward the end of the lecture. So PCG, procedural content generation, what is it? Well, let's break down the, uh, the term. So we have procedural generation is the first uh, thing. So we have procedural here. What does that mean? It means, well, the definition is with no or limited human intervention. So essentially, you can think of PCG or as pr of procedural generation um, of anything as algorithmic or automatic generation in some, in some cases. So it may be completely 100% automatic. It may have some human intervention, but it's some sort of algorithmic or automated generation of content. And of course, the content part, um, content is going to be things that affect our gameplay somehow in our game. So we're not necessarily modifying the game engine. There are some people out there doing PCG that make actual games, um, like making the mechanics of the game and stuff. But um, we're not going to be covering things like that. It's a bit too complex for this course. And so procedural content generation for games, we can have PCG in almost any game that we could think of. So I have some examples here. Of course, you are all very familiar um, with Minecraft by now, especially those of you doing the Minecraft project. And so there is a ton of PCG going on in Minecraft. Whenever you start up uh, a Minecraft uh, world, it takes an integer seed and it turns it into a world. And so that random number generation um, is able to produce, uh, algorithmically produce a world for you to explore somehow. Very similarly, this happens in Terraria as well. Oops, my camera is blocking the Terraria logo up here. But Terraria is essentially, uh, I apologize, I know that this isn't true, but in an abstract sort of way, Terraria is like a 2D version of Minecraft, right? Um, where you are in a world, it is procedurally generated, and you get blocks and you, you do stuff. So if we look here, we actually have an animation of how the Terraria world um, is, at least in theory, generated. So you can see that some things are generated before others. Now we're generating the lava. Um, let me go back and start this one over. So we've generated the basic structure of the top and the bottom, put some caves in. Now we have some dungeon-like areas. Then there's some lava down here. Here's the lava at the very bottom of the world. Um, we've got some tunnels here, and so the game is genera generated procedurally when you start it up. And that will produce some interesting gameplay, and the whole point of this is to make every time you play the game a little bit different. We also have Spelunky. So if you've never played Spelunky, it's a really fun uh, 2D platforming game where your job is to spelunk or go down in a mine, and the levels are generated um, pseudo-randomly every time that you play the game. We've also heard of uh, No Man's Sky. This is the game that claimed to, you'll never need another game again, right? Because No Man's Sky has infinite content. Um, the game turned out to be okay, but it had a little bit of a rocky start. But essentially in this game, there's a uh, infinite space that you can explore. You land on planets that maybe nobody has ever seen before, and there are interesting things on those planets. And it turns out we're actually going to ma be making a, um, what would I call it? a simpler version of No Man's Sky, but single player for Assignment 3. 
So we'll we'll get into that uh, in a couple of lectures. Um, a lot of sim worlds have uh, procedural content generation. So if you've ever played Sim City uh, or City Skylines or Tropico or anything like that, every time you load up a new level, it, it generates a new world for you. Of course, we've got the, the granddaddy of them all, Dwarf Fortress, that procedurally generate not only the level, but the entire history of the dwarves in the world that you've created. So procedural content generation can go really, really deep. And Dwarf Fortress is kind of, I guess, I wouldn't say the pinnacle, but probably the game with the most procedural content generation going on in it. Of course, we can also do things like very simple mazes. Um, so we can generate mazes algorithmically that are solvable and have certain properties. I'll just let this one finish out here. So there we go. That's one way to generate a maze. Uh, we can also have PCG generate uh, interesting dungeons for games. And so here we've got an example of an algorithm doing that. We can also uh, generate things like terrain. So we can use the output from things like uh, noise algorithms, which we'll talk about in a, I think, next lecture, um, to generate height maps for terrain that do interesting things. We can generate things like weather for our environments. Um, we can also have uh, computer assisted design, right? So we have PCG that is assisting a human. So for example, in this example here, and I apologize, I don't have a reference for this, um, but the human is kind of, the human designer is clicking where they want stuff to be, but then the PCG is determining what should go there. All right, so that's, that's kind of interesting uh, marriage between algorithmics and, and human design. So what can procedural content generation actually do? Well, ideally, what you're going to do is create endless games and endless content, right? Um, that's not always the case. I mean, games like Minecraft have achieved that to a certain level. Um, but there is still some things about the game that, you know, a human should probably have a hand in, like, you know, the game mechanics and the point of the game and stuff like that. What it can do uh, in practice is reduce game development time and cost by auto-generating content for you. So if you've ever made actual games, um, it turns out that a lot of the time the game engine itself, the programming of the game engine, is not the hardest part. Oh, I don't want to say hardest, but not the most time-consuming part. Usually the content generation and the markup that humans have to do to make the game world interesting probably takes more time than creating the game engine itself. And so procedural content generation can help you by populating your world um, within certain constraints. Um, PCG can create games that adapt their worlds and properties to player preferences. So this is sort of a holy grail of PCG that not a lot of companies have gotten right, but what you can think of is like, let's say I'm going through a game uh, like Skyrim, right? And I'm going through the game and I am demonstrating to the game that I really like melee combat. Or maybe I'm sneaking around in the game. Or maybe I've chose to cast spells, right? So you can think of games completely adapting to your style of play. Like if you want to go through a stealth game, maybe it generates more dungeons where stealth is required. Or if you like just being a mage and blowing everything up, maybe, you know, it adapts the enemies to have more defense against mage or something. Or maybe more loot for mages drops like that. Um, but PCG can also help us better understand the game design process by formalizing it and making it algorithmic, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. Someone had a question out there. It says, surely it takes more effort to make something like Unreal Engine compared to just the content for Fortnite. So what I meant by that is uh, not creating a game engine like Unreal or Unity, not that sort of generic engine that you can make anything in. But what I mean is, if you have a game like Skyrim, right, the programming of the game engine, I meant like the game mechanics, like what happens when you jump, what happens when you press A, stuff like that. Like the actual taking of the game and implementing mechanics, like the implementing of the game mechanics of a game like Skyrim, of something like Fortnite, takes far less time than the generating of all the content for that game. But that's a really good question. I should have been a little bit more clear on that. <clears throat> So what are some of the, the trade-offs for, for procedural content generation? No, no algorithm, no method is just perfect, right? You've, you've always got to have some trade-offs when it comes to anything algorithmic related. The first one is computation speed, right? So do you want 
real-time generation of content or do you want design time generation of content? Which one are you going to pick? Um, reliability and stability is a big issue with PCG because it's not a human generating it, right? So one thing that I've found in some games that quite obviously have used PCG is let's say you're falling down, you're going down a mountain or something like that and you get stuck behind a rock, right? Like, and then your game kind of soft locks because you can't escape. You've got to like reload your last save. And so the thing about PCG is you can have some failures or edge, edge cases that really do break gameplay because it's not a human authored thing. Now you could argue that you could also use PCG to somehow check for those edge cases, but in general, PCG can, can generate some things that you probably don't want in your game. And <clears throat> one way to solve that is through the use of controllability, right? So when you create your PCG algorithm, what does the designer allow, um, what is the designer allowed to specify to the algorithm? Does it just say, make me a world? Or does it allow the designer to say, you know, I want one chair in each room of that dungeon? Or what are the constraints or the goals of the PCG? So that's that's a, um, a consideration as well when you're, when you're making PCG. Also, um, diversity or creativity. So do, maybe you can have a theme, like I want a snow world or something like that. Um, also, what you find with PCG sometimes is that the content may look like computer generated, right? Or fake. And I've, I've gone into some, um, to some dungeons, for example, in some games and been like, oh yeah, this is, this is probably computer generated. Or this is definitely human generated because something, some like human narrative trope is being expressed through the design of that dungeon. Right. And so <clears throat> sometimes you may want that. Sometimes you may not want that. So when it comes to PCG, we've got a certain taxonomy that we're going to talk about or certain um, terms or definitions related to PCG. And so we've got um, a bunch of different things here. And let's go through them now and, and talk about what these are, because all of these have to be considerations when you're designing or using a PCG system. So the first one is online or offline. So off, in offline PCG, the entire world is going to be generated before the game is launched and no new content is going to be generated after the game start. So to a certain extent, let me wave my hands a little bit and be a little bit abstract. This is kind of what Minecraft does, right? So I know that technically the, no, the entire world of Minecraft is not generated. Let's say Terraria. Okay, I think Terraria is entirely generated before um, the game starts. So you launch the game, there's some sort of loading screen where the generation happens, and then a minute later, you're in the game and nothing else will be generated. Online methods, the world is generated at least partially after the game has been launched or while running. So the, the world will grow as you move around within that game. So that's the difference between online and offline. So if we had an exam in this course, this would be a good question for the exam, right? Um, the controllability of your PCG. So for example, an uncontrollable PCG algorithm does all the generation automatically with no user or design input. Now, this comes with a caveat, of course, that a human created the PCG algorithm, right? Or some AI or whatever. So if something created something else, then intrinsically there are going to be some design or input into the algorithm, right? Like if I, you know, the creators of the Minecraft algorithm, they created the algorithm. So they said, you know, the world has to be within this size because we have finite memory. But, but what I mean by uncontrollable here is that there's no parameterization to the running of the algorithm, right? You can just run it and it will generate whatever it wants. Now that may not be super useful in comparison to the other version, which is the controllable um, version, right? So you could have various parameters or configuration settings that allow the designers to like tune the, the final generated output. So it's useful when game design requires specific features to, to be present on given levels. So for example, if we're doing um, a, a Spelunky like game and we've got levels, and we want to generate a level where it's like, okay, there should be at least three platforms, at most 20 platforms. There has to be a door that we find, and there has to be a key that we find to open the door. And maybe we don't want the key and the door to spawn on the same screen, 
right? So this is what I'm talking about when it comes to controllable. Also, we we don't want there to be too many enemies, right? Like if I said, okay, I want there to be a hundred enemies, we don't want those enemies to all be on the same screen and just destroy the player, right? We want them to be spread out a little bit. And some. so we do want typically some controllability when it comes to, to these PCG algorithms. Generic or adaptive? Um, so generic would mean that um, it creates the same content with no regard for like existing variables or conditions. Whereas adaptive, you might change the generated output depending on the location of existing features, player properties, etc. Right? So um, I think that some game, well, what game was it? Was it Left 4 Dead? Left 4 Dead used some, now I don't want to say procedural content generation because it didn't necessarily build the levels, but it did do something where like the, the gameplay and the spawning of enemies was dictated by things like the health of the players, where they were in the level, etc. So that would be very adaptive, but generic would be more like, you know, Minecraft is kind of generic because you the player is sort of the world is created and then the player is put into it, right? It's not like you say, okay, I'm going to have a player. They're going to start with these conditions and then the world is going to adapt around that. Stochastic or deterministic? Um, of course, this is, you know, pretty obvious, but deterministic means essentially no randomness. And so the algorithm will generate the exact same output every time with no randomness. Stochastic, however, would use some form of random number generation um, at the core of the method to produce randomized results. And I know people are probably out there screaming about randomness in computers. I have a whole section on that, so don't worry. And you may generate different outcomes each time that it is run for a given scenario. Um, so in terms of how the PCG algorithms generate content algorithmically, um, there are a few different kinds. Two of those are constructive um, versus generate and test. So in constructive, the algorithm guarantees that at completion, it will have generated a usable example. So what that means is your algorithm, when it runs, you know that there's going to be a guaranteed solution. So for example, let's say we are, we have some algorithm that generates mazes, right? And so we could have two ways of generating mazes at a, at a high level. One would be constructive, where the generation of the maze would guarantee, without a doubt, that there would be a path from the start to the goal, okay? But the other way would be generate and test, which means that the methods generate a candidate solution and then test it for feasibility or fitness, okay? So in the maze example, you might generate a maze and then test to see if it is solvable, right? Now, that might not be a good type of thing to do for maze generation, right? You'd probably want something constructive for maze generation, but generate and test, what you could do is say, have an algorithm um, which keeps some candidates with high fitness and throw away those that are undesirable. So what does that mean? So for example, let's say we're trying to build a level for a first person shooter game, right? We might not meet, we may want to have some sort of properties on that level. And so what we could do is generate maybe a thousand levels, run some algorithm to, to generate a fitness or a score for each of those levels, and then keep the best one that we generated. Okay, so that's the difference between constructive, where it's going to build the thing right away and generate and test, will generate a candidate solution somehow, and then we'll test it for whether or not it's viable or how good it is. Uh, authorship of PCG. So in autonomous authorship, then all content is generated by the PCG method. And in mixed authorship, some of the content may be generated by other sources. And then the PCG methods generate the rest around it, right? So in this example, maybe we draw like the outline of a dungeon and like where the key is and where the door is and where the loot chest is, and then say, okay, do the rest of the dungeon around this for me. So some sort of mixed authorship. So there are a bunch of different uh, types of methods for doing PCG. I'm not gonna list them all here, but just some of them. So probably the most, I would say the most common form of PCG is going to be some sort of ad hoc construction. And, and what I mean by ad hoc construction here is that you have some very specific algorithm 
that maybe uses a little bit of randomness to generate what you want, right? So for example, let's say you want to generate a bunch of circles, right? Then ad hoc construction would know, okay, we're generating circles, generate some circles, put them in a, in a particular configuration, right? So it's sort of a, a handcrafted algorithm for your very specific case of PCG, right? So if you're generating Super Mario Brothers levels, right, 2D platformer type levels, you wouldn't want your algorithm to be able to create like 3D Valorant levels or something like that. So it's sort of an ad hoc construction with, with a lot of constraints. We could have a search-based um, level creation, right, where we actually search the space of possible locations um, or possible um, worlds and then through the actions we can do in that space of generating content. Um, do I have slides on all of these? No, I don't. Okay. Um, so yeah, search would mean that you are trying a bunch of possibilities and then based on some evaluation function, you are picking one of those possibilities that you generated. And this doesn't mean that some methods are ad hoc and some methods are search based. Ad hoc methods could also use search. Okay. Um, solver based. So a solver would be, it could use search, but it doesn't have to use search, could use some other form of problem solving. Um, but in a solver-based thing, we've got some constraints. And so we're gonna say, like I said before, build a level, it's gonna have a key, it's gonna have a door, it might, you, the player is going to have to walk at least a minute to find the, um, the key and then another minute to find the door, right? So generate some sort of dungeon like this that has that, those constraints. And then whatever method, algorithmic method you would use to solve those constraints, that would be a solver-based method. Um, you can have grammar-based methods. Uh, oops, just let me check something here. No, okay. Uh, I just wanted to be double sure that I didn't have any um, Examples of these. So in a grammar-based method, um, if you have something like what's called an L system, you actually have like a language um, that can specify shapes or things that your, th that your PCG method can generate. And I wish I had a, uh, uh, an example of that here. I thought I did. That's what I just went with a check, but I don't. But this is essentially the generation of strings within some grammar, and those strings represent your final um, outcome. You could have random noise or fractal-based generation. So we'll be talking about noise-based PCG in the next um, uh, lecture. And we will also be talking about cellular automata in the next lecture as well. And you could also have um, machine learning-based methods that sort of learn. Um, so for example, if you go into these, uh, what is it? So you have these AI systems now, like Dolly, that can generate images. So if you say like, generate an image of two, uh, cats getting married or something like that, you know, you'll, it'll generate something. But you can also say, like, generate a level for a, a video game that's never been seen before, and it might be able to draw, like, a simple outline of a level or something like that. So you could have machine learning be doing PCG for you as well. Okay. PCG and randomness. Randomness is very, very important in many forms of procedural content generation. Because we, the whole point of PCG, usually, is that we want to generate something different every time, right? We don't want to just generate it and, and make it stick there and the user never experiences anything different. The whole point of PCG, typically, is to generate different things. So many PCG methods rely on stochastic methods for randomizing the generation. The main idea here is that randomness is going to lead to diversity, right? So we won't generate the same thing every time unless for some reason we want to. And the important thing to keep note um, for the rest of the PCG part of this course is that complete randomness is usually not what we mean when we say randomize or randomness, okay? So saying randomly generated usually means that we used randomness to guide the generation. But of course, if it was true randomness, it would just be like a slew of black and white pixels and we'd never really um, have anything usable. So a question out there for those of you in the chat who are paying attention. Would you say that this is generating random points? Okay, so let's talk about randomness for just a little bit. Would you say that this is randomness? Like true randomness, unpredictability.
Okay, got someone out there saying no. So maybe there's not a lot of people out there. That's fine. Someone said probably not. Not completely, no, doubt. All right. So I think that the best answer there was not completely, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, this particular method, this uses randomness, but it uses randomness to guide the generation, okay? So I'll show uh, another bit of this, but you can see that this algorithm is actually using some other geometrical method in order to guarantee that there is a space between all the points. You can see here that there are no two points that are overlapping, right? If this was truly just generate me some random points, we would see much more clustering and overlapping of points, etc. So this is a good example of using randomness, but not complete randomness, right? So here's an example here. If you had to look at these four, just out there in the chat, which would you say A, B, C, or D? Which of these is would you say is randomly generated? And I would say completely random. Like, just give me random X, Y locations. Okay, so we got Ds, Bs, and Ds. Nobody is saying A or C. So that's, that's a good eye, right? So this is using that algorithm that we just saw of this minimum inverse distance in which you can see here that even though the points are like kind of, they're not, they're not placed by hand. There's some randomness there, right? But we've also got some constraints on that randomness, which is keeping them from overlapping each other. Here on B and D, we, do, we did just say, okay, give me random points. So um, you can see here the difference between the two. If you want complete randomness, you're going to get some features of that randomness, which are, for example, okay, some points are going to overlap. And if you don't want that, then you have to place constraints on that or some other form of algorithm that uses randomness, but is not completely random. All right, so I just wanted to show that. Now, pseudo-random numbers. True randomness, whatever that means, okay, cannot exist in a computer. That is not what computers are designed to do. Computers are designed to take input and produce output, not come up with noise from the heavens, okay? So true random number generation cannot exist within the, the, the designed von Neumann architecture that we are using for modern day computers, all right? So whatever methods that we use inside a computer that generates random numbers must take some sort of input and then take that input, apply a whole bunch of math to it to produce an output, right? And that input we call the seed value. Okay, so we take a seed value, we throw some crazy function at it so that the output number looks nothing like the input number. That's typically what's happening when we generate pseudo-random numbers. And so we call them pseudo-random because they have properties of randomness, but they are not actually randomly generated. So various math and algorithms applied to the seed value produce a number in the user's desired output range. So that means that, you know, I don't want a random number. Like in my game, I might want a random number um, that is a integer, between 12 and 31, right? I might want that. And so um, there's a desired output range of your pseudo random number generator as well. So how do we measure randomness? Now I am not an expert in the field of randomness or entropy or all, of any of that stuff, but I, I know enough about it to, to, to show you what we need for this course. So not all pseudo random number generation is created equal. Right? We can't just add one to a number and call that randomness. So the two main properties, there are other properties of the statistics of pseudo random number generated data sets and stuff. But the two main ones that we were typically concerned with is uniformity and unpredictability. So PRNG provides uniform output if all numbers will come up an equal amount of times eventually. Right, so let's say that we have an output in the range uh, between 1 and 10. So that means if we generate um, a million 
random numbers between one and 10, they will, we can say that that random number generator is uniform if each of those numbers was produced 100,000 times, approximately, right? You're gonna vary a little bit. But like if the number seven was produced 500,000 times and the others were produced like 50,000 times, then that's not a really random uh, uniform random number generator. So most of the time we are looking for uniformity in our random number generator output. Sometimes we aren't, but most of the times we are. Meaning that it's equally likely to produce any of the numbers in our output range. Unpredictability is also very important, possibly the most important. And so we want the, the next number, so given an input, we, we don't want it to be easy to figure out what the next output will be, okay? So we want the next number to be hard to predict, for example, with security, etc. Now, we're not talking about security in this course, but ideally, it's, it's good to be unpredictable when it comes to randomness. So for many cases, we want our output to be uniform and unpredictable. Um, and some places, when they talk about randomness, um, they will talk about randomness in terms of compressibility. So if I have a data string, right? Like if I have a, like a, a, a stream of ones and zeros, how random that string is can be measured by like how much you can actually compress it. Like if you can zip it, it's probably not random, right? Like if zip takes it from one megabyte down to four bytes, then it's probably not random. So if you look at um, a string of a hundred bits, let's say we have a uh, hundred ones. Can you write a way to express 100 ones in a less amount of data than actually writing out a hundred ones? Yes, you could just write a hundred ones. Right? And then that is a way of compressing that data. So if you can figure out a function or a way to compress data a lot, then that data is probably predictable. All right? If it's not compressible, then it's predictable. Therefore, it is not very random. So there's all sorts of ways that people try and test the properties of data to see whether or not it is like random enough. Entropy and randomness. So the predictability of numbers is quanti quantified in a measure called entropy. And entropy is usually measured in bits. So for example, a fair coin toss. Now I'm talking about a real world coin toss in which you are not data from Star Trek, right? You can't flip it perfectly every time. And let's assume for now that the person flipping the coin cannot control the universe, etc. right? So when you flip a coin, it has a 50-50 chance of coming out heads or tails. And for all intents and purposes, it is going to, like one of those is going to come up equally likely as the other. So the output of a coin toss is going to be a heads or a tails or a zero or a one. And it's going to be pretty much completely unpredictable, right? And so if we have a fair coin toss, we have one bit of entropy. But let's say we had a coin with two heads or a coin that always came up tails. If it produces the same output every single time and it's completely predictable, then we would say that that has zero bits of entropy. Okay. If we had, for example, a die um, and that die had eight sides, right? So whenever I roll this die, it's you know, going to give me a fairly random number um, on that die. So since we can represent eight things within three bits, then an, a fair eight-sided die would produce three bits of entropy. And entropy is distinct from statistical randomness, okay? So for example, measuring statistical randomness or compressibility is not the same thing necessarily as entropy. Because for example, the digits of pi, if you do a bunch of stats, if you like write out pi to a trillion places, the digits of pi are statistically random, right? They have all the properties of randomness. They, you know, they're equally distributed. They have all sorts of great properties, but we can predict the next number of pi, right? If we're looking at the sequence of pi, I can, I can make an algorithm that generates the digits of pi right? And so they are predictable. 
So there's a, there's a small difference there. Um, they are predictable because we know the algorithm that generates pi, but they are statistically random. Because if you don't know that algorithm that generates pi, it's very difficult to guess the next number. If we have a large output range or a large number, it does not necessarily imply a high entropy. Okay, why is that? So let's say, for example, we generate a random number from 1 to 16. So let's say we have a 16-sided die. Okay, now we roll that die. This has four bits of entropy. Then we use that value to generate a 32-bit number. So a number between 1 and 4 billion. So for example, we're going to multiply the number that we get out by 100 million, right? So the resulting large number still only has four bits of entropy. And the reason is because the original value that we generated randomly with the die roll had four bits of entropy, okay? So we can't generate new entropy magically. So the output range does not determine the entropy, the method of generating the randomness um, determines the entropy. So the predictability of the final output is the same as the entropy of the smaller number in this case. Now let's have a look. Um, you know, you say that, okay, true randomness doesn't exist in a computer, but, you know, we have things that are fairly secure, so how do they do it, right? So let's look at an example of entropy generation in the Linux kernel, all right? So now this, these numbers may have changed since I made this slide. Different distros, different kernel versions may use different numbers, but this is essentially what happens. On Linux, randomness is generated by the kernel entropy pool, all right? So you might have 4,096 bits of, of kernel entropy. Generating random numbers, if you ask Linux, give me a random number, if you ask your operating system to give you a random number, it actually depletes that entropy pool. Right? So if I'm running on Linux and I say, give me a random number or give me some entropy, it will give you a number that is fairly random, but it depletes the amount of randomness that it has left. And that, that pool of entropy must then be replenished. Okay, So the kernel needs to be able to fill this memory. And so you can actually see how many bits of, of entropy you have available by, by doing this um, command. And replen replenishing that pool is called stirring the entropy pool. Because you can think of it as like stirring, creating a bit more randomness. And so the cool thing is, in operating systems, other sources can be used to stir that entropy pot. But I just said that randomness is impossible to like generate in a computer. So what is the magic behind that, right? Like, how do we generate randomness or entropy? We, we can't use magic. So what do we actually do? And one of the cool things is the kernel is actually watching you, right? The operating system is, is looking at, now not, not with a camera, but is watching what you do. So the system time of a computer is very, very accurate, down to like microseconds sometimes. And so the timestamps of user input, the keyboard, the mouse, maybe a microphone, whatever, can be used to stir the entropy pot. And I'm not going to be using... Like, I'm not really going to get into the math of all this. There's lots of math that goes on here. But essentially, if you take the microsecond timing in which I've moved the mouse or, you know, pressed a key on the keyboard, that is, again, essentially random, right? Because it is very unpredictable to, to, for me to guess when I'm going to move the mouse down to, like, the microsecond. So based on, like, user inputs, sometimes other things... Um, we can stir that entropy pot. So we've got the Linux RNG flowchart. We've got some entropy sources, like real world sources of things that are essentially random. Keyboards, system interrupts, disk, speed, temperature, mouse movements. That goes into the primary entropy pool. And then we've got two types of entropy pools. We've got blocking entropy pools and non-blocking entropy pools. And essentially what this says, so here we've got um, dev random, which is blocking, and dev u random, which is non-blocking. And so what we do here is if, if we just write in an infinite loop, give me um, dev random bits of entropy, 
This is blocking, meaning that if it runs out of entropy, you will have to wait for it to generate new entropy before it can give you new random numbers. And down here, this is a non-blocking entropy pool. And so you may run out of entropy, but it will still give you numbers based on previous entropy. Okay, so this is essentially the, the Linux uh, RNG flowchart. Now, there are other ways to get entropy as well. So some modern hardware can come with special instructions that generate entropy. It's harder per to, to predict than software, but it's not perfect, okay? And so random.org, you know, if you go to generate numbers there, it claims to have like true random numbers and they get their random numbers from like entropy from atmospheric noise. And so users are limited to a number of bits of randomness per day on random.org. You can pay for more, I think. But essentially, they might have like some sensor in the sky, or, you know, at their office, whatever, that just generates noise in the wind or something like that, right? And so it's very, very hard to predict real world measurements. And so that is their source of entropy. Um, there was this story uh, before. I'm not even sure if this is true or not. I couldn't find definitively if it was true, but Cloudflare had this wall of lava lamps that they were using to generate entropy because the lava lamps are kind of, the movement of them is hard to predict. I find that kind of fun. I don't think it's, I don't think they were actually using that though. I think that may have been an April Fool's thing. Um, and of course, like I just said before, we could have real world measurements that are like measuring on a temperature or wind speed or, you know, whatever type of atmospheric changes um, that humans are not in control of to sort of generate the, the, an the entropy pool for that. Different operating systems are going to do it in different ways, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So random numbers in C++, this is really what we're concerned with, right? Is, okay, Dave, how do I do the assignment? I know you're all just like, you know, who cares? We don't have an exam, just tell me what to do for the assignment. So here, here we go. So the simplest way to generate random numbers in C++ is to use this rand function, which is also present in C. For serious security, if you were doing any sort of encryption, logging onto your website, generating salt or hashes or whatever, don't use RAND. It is not considered to be secure or safe, but for our course, it could be fine for our needs, okay? Random number generators take a seed, which determines the outcome of future RNG. So whenever we use RAND, it's going to give us a new random number. Just one second. Uh... So whenever we call rand, it gives us a new random number. So it might give us 0, 421, 3,204, right? And we can seed that randomness with an integer. So the default seed is 0, meaning that if you do not specify a seed for the rand function, it will generate the same sequence of RNG every single time you run that program. So, you know, if you generate a million random numbers with rand, if you have never called srand to seed the random number, every time you run the program, you're going to get the same million numbers in the exact same order, okay? So what some people do is they take the input time. So this is the time that your system measures and you use that as an input to the seed for your random number generator. Now that's kind of a hacky way to do it, but it seeds based on the current second, which is what time time gives you back. So the, I've actually had bugs in software before where I thought that the program was, was broken because it was producing the same sequence of numbers even though I was seeding the randomness with the time. So I'm like, why is it producing the same two sequences of numbers? And it was because I ran the program twice in the same second. And so the same seed was being pro passed into the program. And so the same um, numbers were being generated. So that was, that was kind of funny. But of course, we don't want just a random number. This is going to give us a random integer between 0 and 4 billion. We want a random number within a range. Okay. Um, so... Given a range, so if you want, uh, say, a number between min and max, where this means inclusive, what we're going to do is the following little bit of math. And I'm sure you could all figure this out. I just wanted to give you um, the math behind it. So we're going to calculate first this diff value, which is the difference or distance between the max and the min. So we're going to take max, we're going to subtract min, and we're going to add one. We're going to add one because this is inclusive, okay? So then if we say r equals rand, this is going to give us a random number. 
then we modulus with the diff. So what this means is now we have a number which is between zero and diff minus one inclusive, okay? Then what we do is we take r and we add min back to that. And we add the min number back to get the proper range. And so what we get in the end is r is equal to min plus rand mod one plus max minus min. And so this is how we get, um, I don't know why my mouse is lagging so much. Um, Sometimes PowerPoint does this. All right. So R equals min plus ran mod one plus max minus min. And so here's an example just to show you that we have this function. Let's say we have a range of 30 to 40. So the diff is going to be 11. So there are 11 possible values in the range of 30 to 40, right? Inclusive. So R equals rand mod 11. That'll give us a number between zero and 10. And then we take r and we add min to that. And so min is 30. So now we have 30 plus a random number between zero and 10. And this also works if the two numbers are the same. So um, if we go through here, uh, rand mod one is always going to give us zero. So it's 20 plus one. So we can use this no matter if the what, what the range difference is. As long as we have uh, the max and the min, min specified before the max then this function will work. Now, I said that rand is not very good, um, but we do have other C++ random engines that we can use that's included with the modern STL. So if you are in need of a more secure RNG in C++, there are a number of RNG engines. And the general way that this goes in C++, oh, I am so frustrated by this lag. It makes it like impossible for me to, to do this. Just give me a second here. All right, hopefully, this is going to work better. Okay, so we set up, and the, the way that we use these engines in C++ is we set up an engine object. We set up a distribution, which that engine object is going to use, and then we sample from the engine with the distribution. This is much slower than RAND, but it gives us statistically randomly better results. Okay, so here's a way, uh, here's some example code for this is uh, this is a standard random device, okay? So that is the object that we will use to generate random numbers. We have a default random engine, and we are going to pass in R into this. Then we are going to create a distribution. So for example, we have a uniform int distribution, and we'll call that uniform dist, and we want this to be generating numbers between the min and the max. Then we can get different properties of that by calling different functions on that distribution, okay? Uh, if we want to generate a normal distribution, we can actually have normal distributions um, instead of just random, or sorry, instead of uniform distributions, we can have normal distributions. If you wanna generate data within a different distribution, that's fine. And without going too much more into this code, cause I'm, I'm running a bit low on time, I wanna get into the, some other stuff. Here we could, um, generate, you know, just, just go here. You can read all about the, the randomness and all this different generators and distributions that are available with the C++ STL. So the previous slide had two distributions, um, uniform random. So the RNG has an equal chance of picking any number in the desired range and, and don't confuse the uniform random with equal spacing. It just means we have an equal chance of getting a number, not that they're equally spaced and a normal distribution. So RNG from a normal distribution with a standard mu and sigma that you have with normal distributions. So here are some, um, some RNG sample histograms. So if we generate a bunch of random numbers, oh my God, it happened again. What is going on with PowerPoint? I think whenever I move my mouse outside of this. Okay, anyway. Um, so here is a uniform distribution. They're not exact, but each of these numbers was generated pretty much the same amount of times. This would be a normal distribution, okay, where we have this, uh, this bell curve type shape and normal distribution. And here we have an exponential distribution. Um, you can still have a bunch of different things. Okay, um, uh, for some reason now, I have a bunch of people asking in the chat why the class is online, uh, because it's a remotely delivered course, that's it that because I chose to do that for this course. Um, I, I, I like delivering classes remotely. 
So that's, that's the answer to your question. Um, different distributions are used for different things. So for example, sometimes we may want a, uh, oh, sorry. That's not what I meant by this slide. If we look up in different types of sciences, these words that we have been using, uniform, random, etc., mean different things. So try not get to con confused by this. In biology, for example, if we look at a population, um, they may call that population uniform to mean equal spacing. Okay, versus we are talking about uniform with respect to the distribution of random of, of the random numbers. So just realize that if you go look at other sciences, they may use these terms in slightly different ways. But please go with this one. Um, now, you may say, why would we want different distributions? Well, it's because the things that we are trying to generate sometimes fall into different distributions. So for example, if we look at all the planets that we know of as of six years ago, seven years ago, oh my God, this is an old slide. Um, the planets in the universe that we can observe are not uniformly distributed, right? There are more of this size of planet than there are of this size of planet. I'm going to move to the pen for a second. Uh, here we go. Man, I'm so annoyed by this. Look at that. This like doesn't happen like this normally. All right. So if we wanted to generate planets very realistically, then what we would do is not use a uniform distribution. We would try and model this distribution somehow. Okay. So what we want typically when we're doing PCG is the fastest possible PRNG system that has good enough security. Okay. So when security is not the highest priority, we just want good enough pseudo random number generation, which means it's kind of hard to predict good enough so that humans can't detect the patterns when they look at it essentially and very fast to compute. That does not need to rely on outside entropy. And the reason is we don't want to be relying on our operating systems entropy pool because we may want to have millions and millions of random numbers. We're generating so much randomized stuff that we want to be completely in control of the RNG. We don't need the super security of the Linux kernels entropy pool in order to do, to generate a Mario level, right? And luckily this type of function exists. Now, what I will mention is that many types of this function exist, but after a lot of searching and a lot of testing, this is the best of such systems that I have found, that I have found, all right? If you have found a different one that is better in terms of its unpredictability and speed, I, I seriously doubt that you have, but if you have, please contact me because I'd love to, to present it. So these are called linear congruential generators. They are also called Park Miller RNG, um, and they are named after the people who created this type of, of PRNG, right? So linear congruential generators or LCGs, the formula essentially is that the next number in our sequence that we want to create is some multiple of the previous number in the sequence mod our some very large prime number, okay? Prime because it lets us do non-cyclical um, non things, and I'll show you that in a second. So M is the modulus. Typically, it is a large fixed prime number. A is a multiplier. It is a fixed positive integer less than M. And XO is an initial seed, which means the first number that we have, it's a positive integer less than M. So we have to come up with like an initial number somehow, but that's fine. We just come up with an initial sum number somehow. That's our initial seed, right? So if we're generating something like Minecraft, maybe we want the um, program to be able to take in a seed so that we could regenerate something. So, th so that X zero, the first X is the initial seed. It's going to produce integers in the range from zero to M minus one. And what it does is it's going to be doing this using efficient integer math and bit operations to compute this very, very quickly. So here is a sort of abstract way of looking 
at how these linear congruential generators work. So we have M over here and we have X zero we've chosen to be somewhere in here. Okay. Now we're going to take X zero. We are going to multiply it by some value and we're going to mod it by M. So here we go. We have the next value in our sequence. Then we multiply it. The, the previous number again, Maybe we get this one in our sequence, then this one, 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 okay? So we keep getting new random numbers, and if this initial value is co-prime to m, then we will not cycle, right? So for example, if m was 8 and this was 4, for example, we would just cycle back between 4 and 8, 4 and 8, 4 and 8, and we wouldn't generate any of these other numbers. So A is what I've shown you here in this example was a very, very basic example that you would not use because I'm just going like one, uh, one times XO, two times XO, three times XO, four times XO. That's actually quite predictable. But when A is very, very large, what we get is we can't really predict where it will be when we modulus with M. Right? So we may get one here, then one here, then one here, then one here, then one here. But we're guaranteed for it to not cycle within this, um, within this modulus, which is really nice property. So LCGs work in cycles, which you'd think is really bad for, for random number generation. But it turns out when you have like really large prime numbers and really large multipliers, then these are unpredictable okay and, but you have to find a proper version of a and a proper version of m right so luckily there are people out there who've done that work for us so we don't want these to cycle in predictable ways we want to cycle in unpredictable ways um, and so the uniformity and predictability depend on those three variables that are used by the function okay so x0 a and m those are the things. So we can, if we use these and we use the wrong values, we can have like really bad patterns in the data that we don't want to have, okay? And so what we can do, uh, there are different types of LCGs named after different people. Um, we, if we wanted to, for example, generate a texture that is patterned, we can use LCGs to do that. But if we want to generate like statistically random output, we're going to need to find good values um, for these numbers somehow, okay? So what I have found to be the best for my particular use cases is the Lamer RN PRNG function. Uh, Lamer, Lamer, I'm gonna say Lamer because that's how it looks to me. I, I've never heard the name pronounced. Um, but it's a type of LCG named after DH Lamer who invented it. And so they find co-prime constants that make that type of LCG have good enough random properties for us. And it's efficient, extremely efficient to compute with integer multiplication and bit shifting. So here is the overall, like this is the way that Lamer RNGs work. So we have this global seed here. Every time that we call the Lamer RNG function, it is going to give us a different number out based on the previous version of that seed. So what we do is we are going to change, when we call this function, we increment the seed somehow by some nice value so that the next time we call this function, we will have a new random number. Then we create a new value, which is the seed times a very specific large value, right? And then optionally, we could do some fancy bit shifting to scramble that value a little bit more, and then we return that value. So it's a very, very efficient way to take a seed value, multiply it by a huge random value, and then that, since the modulus operator is a very expensive operator, we actually do a sort of modulus by doing bit shifting instead of modulus. So on each call, the seed is incremented so a new random number is generated based on this internal seed that we have. So what we get is something like this. We have an initial seed, it goes through the first iteration, it produces a value, and then we have a new seed for the next one. Okay, so this is sort of an illustration of what's happening. In this example, we are using 
the previous value as a seed for the next um, for the next iteration. We could do that, or we could just add or multiply the seed to change the seed somehow. So the best version, the actual implementation version that I recommend um, for most of you to use if you just want good enough fast RNG is the following version. Um, oh, not only that, but we can remove the global seed and pass in our own seed to the function so that every time we call the function with the same seed, we are going to get a new, uh, the same value, okay? So this is completely deterministic based on the seed. However, it's going to have a really nice property for us for assignment three that we'll see. So whenever we pass in a number, we are going to get an essentially random number back based on that seed. So what we do is we pass in a 128-bit seed. And well, this is for generating 64-bit random numbers. So that's that's why there are versions of this for 16 bits, 32 bits, whatever. But we're, we're going to be using 64 bits for this class. We take that seed and we multiply it by this magical number, this magical, magical, wonderful number. Then we take that seed and we bit shift it to the right by 64 and truncate it. And then that is our random number. And it turns out that this random number has really, really great random properties. Um, well, sorry, this magic number has great random properties. And this is the random number generator function I use in basically all of my research. And how did they find that magic number? Well, um, decades ago, this there was this paper that was released and it's called uh, Tables of Linear Conjugential Generators of Different Sizes and Good Lattice Structure. And they found good numbers, right? So that, that paper literally has pages and pages of these constants that you would use if you want to generate random numbers within certain ranges. And so you take that. There you go. That's, that's how we found that. In assignment three, we're going to have a very specific use case for the lamer RNG function, okay? So let's say that we have a specific XY location and we want to generate a random number based on that XY location, but we want that to be the same every time we call it for that XY location. So one way to accomplish that would be with RAND, right? But RAND is super slow, reseeding it is even slower, it's super annoying. So we're going to modify the lamer PRNG function to do this for us. So here's the use case. Let's say we have a grid, right? And there's a specific location on that grid and we're doing some PCG. So me, we might want to say, um, what is the, does a rock exist at this location? Does a key exist at this location, right? We're trying to generate a random number based on that location, which is an X, Y location. But the lamer RNG function takes in a single integer seed. So what we can do is we take an x, y pair and turn it into a single integer somehow, then feed that into the lamer RNG function and we get our random number based on that. So that random number is, it's hard to predict, right? But it is actually deterministic. So if we run this program multiple times, we are going to get the same value for that um, particular um, instance. Now, that might be a good thing if we're creating a game, right? Because if you're like playing like No Man's Sky, for example, if you if you're generating a game like that, then, you know, if someone has a particular save game, you don't want the the randomness to be different on every frame of the game, and so you might want this thing to generate the same thing multiple times in a row. So, once I explain assignment 3, uh, you'll you'll see why this is is pretty important. So here's what we can do. If we want a version of the lamer PRNG function that instead of taking in one seed, takes in two seeds, what we can do is we can take in these two numbers, pass one of them into the lamer RNG function, which will essentially produce a randomized number based on that, then XOR it with the second seed. This gives us a single seed value that we can then pass back into this lamer RNG function because we essentially have to produce one number from two numbers, right? And we can't just like add them together. 
because then the, the position one, two would give us the same result as three, zero, right? We can't just multiply them or divide them. It's actually quite difficult to come up with a formula to combine two numbers to get a unique other number. So what we do is we actually use the lemur RNG function to produce a randomized number for this one, XOR it, which is just bit, um, bit shift, not bit shifting, doing the XOR of all the individual bits to produce a sort of randomized seed and then call the lemur RNG function again. And the reason we're going to be doing this is because in assignment three, we are generating a randomized universe. Okay, so by doing what we're going to do is have this huge grid representing the universe and at each point in the grid we are going to be generating planets and the properties of those planets we want to be the same on every frame of the game, right? So that's why we're going to be using this um, uh, lemur RNG function. Once we are on those planets, we are going to be using a different uh, algorithm um, to generate these things to generate, sorry, the terrain of the planets themselves. And so an example uh, from the assignment is we're going to choose an XY point on the map. We are going to generate a random value um, for that XY point. So we can say seed equals lamer two on XY. And then that seed can be used to generate the properties of the star system. So we can take um, that star system, the seed of that star system, and then generate a whole bunch of different random numbers to give you like the radius, the temperature, the number of planets, and each planet seed can be generated similarly. Okay, so I'll explain all of that more when we get to the assignment, but that is this lamer RNG function is going to be the key to everything to generate our universe, right? So that is it for today's lecture. Um, I'm, I'm excited for assignment three. I, a lot of people have said that it's, it's one of their favorite assignments that they've done. So let's have a look at the uh, class schedule. Here we go. Uh, yeah. So in the next lecture on Thursday, I'm going to be talking about cellular automata and Perlin noise. And these are ways of generating interesting terrain like structures that you're going to be uh, using in your games. So thank you so much uh, for tuning in. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.